So I'm Maxime Favier, I'm a postdoc in the Cavity Quantum Electrodynamics Group at Laborato Laboratory Castle Brussel and Collège de France. Um, and today I want to tell you a little bit about um, a new quantum simulation platform that we are developing uh, with laser-trapped circular Rydberg atoms. Okay, so first uh, we'll make a very short uh, overview of the field of quantum simulation from a, let's say, experimentalist perspective. Then I will introduce circular Rydberg atoms and I will show you why we think they are very interesting for quantum simulation. And then I will completely switch gears and go towards our recent uh, experimental results uh, towards this new quantum simulation platform where we have produced ultra-cold uh, circular Rydberg atoms in a cryogenic environment, and we have laser-trapped these, these circular Rydberg atoms. Okay, so what's the, the goal of this quantum simulation business? Well, what we want to do uh, is reproduce the, pro the properties of a regular lattice of uh, interacting spins. So this is one of the simplest uh, quantum eddy body problem you can think of. And in our simulations, uh, we will need two basic uh, ingredients. First, uh, interactions between uh, our, our qubits in the, in, uh, with a direct icing uh, term, uh, which is parameterized by this coefficient Jz. And then another type of interaction, which is a flip-flop or exchange interaction, uh, which is parameterized by this, this coefficient j here. And if you take these two ingredients, already you have many uh, open questions in condensed matter physics. Uh, for example, uh, ground, st ground states in frustrated uh, geometries, out of equilibrium dynamics is a really uh, interesting topic. What happens after a quench? Uh, how do correlations propagate in such a system? and also uh, what's the role of disorder. So then what are the, the basic requirements and ingredients that you need to build a, a quantum simulator for such an interacting spin chain? Well, you need to have a way to encode uh, a spin one half, and you need to be able to build a defect-free chain of such spin one half. And ideally, you need to be able to uh, produce a Hamiltonian that governs the properties of your system where all uh, the important coefficients are exper experimentally accessible. So this is what you cannot do with condensed matter systems and that's where quantum simulation becomes very powerful. And there I added this, uh, this requirement, which is that if you want to observe dynamics over many, many, many cycles of, of interaction, what you need is a system where um, the, two, the two levels have a very long lifetime uh, and where you can also engineer strong interactions. Okay, so there are many quantum simulation platforms available uh, on the market. Um, and they are uh, done in very different physical systems. So you have, for example, condensed matter type uh, qubits, superconducting circuits or quantum dots, or nanophotonic structures. And then you have, uh, let's say, atoms type uh, quantum simulators with trapped ions, ultra-cold atoms in optical lattices, uh, and some proposals for polar molecules in optical lattices. And what I want to first um, tell you a little bit about is the current platforms that use Rydberg atoms uh, for quantum simulation. So what are Rydberg atoms? Well, they are atoms where one electron is promoted to a very high uh, principal quantum number. Uh, they have hydrogenoid properties, and they, have, they are basically very big atoms where the size of the, of the electron orbit scales as the square of the principal quantum number. Okay, so in the rest of the talk we'll be interested in a uh, rubidium atom, which has one valence electron, and which has Rydberg states that are accessible via laser transitions. And the splitting between the, the Rydberg, Rydberg states in a given 
n between two n manifolds will be uh, in the order of 50 gigahertz. So that's one figure that you should remember for the rest. And what, why are these atoms uh, very interesting for quantum simulation? Well, they are basically like tiny uh, dipoles, and they have huge uh, electric polarizabilities, which means that, first of all, they are well coupled to the, to the microwave electromagnetic field, but more importantly, they show very strong dipole-dipole interactions, um, much, much, much bigger than ordinary ground state atoms. And these interactions are actually in the megahertz range of energies. So we, you will have interaction times, uh, typical interaction times between your atoms that are very small, which is good. And in addition, they have quite long lifetimes for, uh, for atomic systems with a few hundred of microseconds for low angular momentum states. Okay, and so these Rydberg atoms, they have been used uh, by a few groups now to do quantum simulation. Um, and basically, they use um, some sort of optical trapping of ground state atoms. And then the atoms are promoted to low angular momentum Rydberg states. So that's the, the two degrees of freedom of the spin, basically. Ground state is down and Rydberg state is up. And in the groups of uh, Antoine Brouwais or Michel Lukin or Emmanuel Bloch, they have showed uh, quantum simulations with quantum quenches or adiabatic sweeps, many beautiful physics. And yet these systems, they suffer from some limitations. And these limitations, let's say, are all related to the fact that the system uh, lives for uh, a short time. And so you, you don't have a long time to do your quantum simulation. Okay, so first of all, the Rydberg atoms are not trapped. Only the ground state atoms are trapped. Uh, and this limits the, the amount of time that you have to probe the atoms and to let them interact. Then the lifetime, as I said, is in the order of a few uh, hundred microseconds, which is somewhat limited. And all these experiments evolve in a room temperature environment. And since these uh, Rydberg atoms are very sensitive to the black body radiation field, this also limits the lifetime. So what we propose is to use uh, a new kind of, of quantum simulation platform with Rydberg atoms promoted to circular states. So what are our circular Rydberg atoms? Well, as normal Rydberg atoms, they have a high principal quantum number. But what you also do is that you promote the electron to the maximum angular momentum state. And so if you have, uh, let's say, a n manifold Rydberg state, and you apply an electric field to lift the degeneracy, the circular state will be the, the state that is completely isolated here at the tip of this, of this triangle, of this manifold. So these atoms, like low angular momentum states, they have strong dipole-dipole interactions. Um, but what's kind of interesting is you can first encode uh, a spin one half in two uh, neighboring circular states. So that's one of the key ingredients that we needed for our quantum simulator. And in addition, they have very long lifetimes. Um, so what happens is that these states can only decay to neighboring uh, circular states. They have no optical transitions, so they have lifetimes in the range of several tens of milliseconds. So that's a factor of 100 improvement already with respect to low angular momentum states. So we propose to encode a spin one half in two circular Rydberg levels. Um, and we chose actually n equals 48 because it's, it's a good balance between strong dipole-dipole uh, interactions and uh, somewhat weak sensitivity to stray electric and magnetic fields. And the, the spin up will be encoded in the n equals 50 uh, state, also a circular state. And so these two states are separated by an energy which is uh, in the range of two photons of uh, 56 gigahertz. But now, things become more interesting if you apply 
a near resonant microwave dressing to these two levels. Because what you get then in the spirit of condensed matter Hamiltonians is a term which is equivalent to longitudinal magnetic field to your, spin of chain, to your chain of spins, and a term which corresponds to a transverse magnetic field. And now these two terms, you have here the detuning of your microwave source and the Rabi frequency, and this you can very easily tune uh, in the experiment. So that's quite nice. And now what we want to do is to add interactions to this picture. And so if you take two atoms, A and B, which are respectively in 48 C and 50 C uh, circular states. Well, you have two types of interactions between these atoms. You have first uh, the off-diagonal elements of this Hamil interaction Hamiltonian, uh, which is uh, energy exchange interaction. So basically, it's a spin flip-flop between 48 C, 50 C, and 50 C, 48 C, if you want. So. This, this is the term, you can write it like this. And here you recognize the first ingredient that I mentioned for the, the Hamiltonian of this, this spin one half chain. And then if you look at the diagonal term of this interaction Hamiltonian, um, it's a direct dipole-dipole interaction between 48, 48, and 50-50. Uh, and this is exactly the icing term that I mentioned at the beginning. Okay, and what's um, important here is that these circular Rydberg levels, they have no net dipole, okay? So they interact via second order van der Waals interactions. And these scales as one over r to the six. So that's a really a pure nearest neighbor interaction. Okay, so now if I take the full uh, picture, the full Hamiltonian, I see that I have uh, uh, X, XZ Hamiltonian with longitudinal spin coupling, transverse spin coupling, and longitudinal and transverse magnetic fields. And so now what happens is that this J coefficient, we cannot tune it in the experiment. So this is what is going to set the, the relevant uh, energy and time scale interaction of the system. But all the other coefficients we can very easily tune. So this JZ coefficient, for example, depends very strongly on uh, magnetic fields and electric fields. And the, with very small uh, variations of the electric field, which we can very easily do in the lab, we can actually tune the, the ratio of JZ over J from a negative value to a positive value. Okay, which is quite nice because it's, it gives us access to this very rich phase diagram for the, for the system where you have ferromagnetic order, paramagnetic order, and nail phases, and you have quantum phase transitions in between these different phases. So here I plot um, the Rabi frequency here, or, or equivalently the magnetic field over, over J, and here Jz over J. So lots of interesting physics that we can do uh, with this system. Yes, I believe so. Mm -hmm. So the coupling case is one of R to the two? Two to the six, actually, six. yeah. Because, so because these so circular states have no dipole. And if you, if you would add this to the state, so then would you the experiment would exchange uh, the phase diagram or not? Or would it be no, I, I don't, it's really negligible, I think, yeah. Okay, so how do we plan to experimentally implement that? Uh, so here you can see in red uh, our chain of, of spins. And you can wonder what are these gold things around it. Well, as I told you, these circular Rydberg levels, they live for a few tens of milliseconds, which is nice already. But there is actually a very simple way in which you can greatly extend this lifetime. And this can have very important cons consequences when you want to look at quantum simulations over uh, very long time scales. Okay, so how does this work? Well, this uh, state 50C can only decay by a microwave photon to the next uh, circular state. And it turns out that the wavelength of this microwave photon is about five millimeters. Now what you can do is put just two uh, plane uh, 
electrodes, so you make here a capacitor. And if you tune the distance between these two electrodes such that it's smaller than half a wavelength of this microwave photon, you restrict the, the modes that the atom can decay to, and basically you completely inhibit the spontaneous emission of these atoms. And what happens is that now the lifetime of a single atom in a circular Rydberg state is in the minute range. And for a, a chain of, let's say, 40 spins, it will be in the second range, which is very, very interesting for quantum simulation. So obviously, you need to trap these, these atoms if you want to make use of this minute range lifetime. Uh, and as we will see a little bit in, in, in the remainder of the, of the talk, it's quite challenging, and it has not yet been demonstrated that we can trap these atoms uh, for extended periods of time in a, in a laser field. So here I show the typical energy exchange that we will have in this system. And this corresponds to a, a time scale of interaction at the level of 15 microseconds. So that means that if you have a, a second range uh, lifetime for your spin chain, you can basically look at the interaction over several 10 to the 4 interaction cycles. And that's really very interesting for, to look at, at thermalization of these systems, uh, propagation of correlations, and things like that. And I also showed you that this uh, XXZ Hamiltonian that, that we engineer is fully tunable over time scales that are essentially uh, zero with respect to the interaction time scale. So this, I think, is something that other quantum simulation platforms cannot do. Okay, so now I'm going to switch gears and go to the experimental part and discuss our recent experimental results towards this end goal of, of building this quantum simulator. Now, we start by preparing an ultra-cold gas of ground state uh, rubidium atoms. So we have uh, a source of, of rubidium atoms. Um, which we collimate using laser light. So we have a bright uh, pre-cooled beam of, of atoms that goes upwards here. And then we use uh, some other laser beams to cool and trap the atoms um, in a dilute uh, magneto-optical trap. So that's a fairly standard technique in, in atom cooling. Um, so these atoms are, are trapped close to an atom chip for, let's say, historical reasons. Um, but what's also important for us is that we enclose the, the atoms in a vacuum chamber first, but also in several layers of, um, of, thermal, uh, ac of, of thermal insulation and cooling, actually. So we have a first shield, which is in contact with a reservoir of liquid nitrogen. And then we have a second one that is in contact with a reservoir of liquid helium. So that means that the environment that, that the atoms see is at four degrees Kelvin. And that is very important to reduce uh, black body radiation um, population loss. Uh, I should point out here that for circular Rydberg atoms, the advantage of the long lifetime is only valid if you're in a cryogenic environment or if you have this spontaneous em emission in inhibition. Okay, so we have prepared a, a big cloud of ultra-cold rubidium atoms in the ground state, and we have typically a few million atoms at a few micro-Kelvin temperature, which is uh, low enough that, that we can load these atoms into a, an optical trap. Okay, now we want to create circular Rydberg states, and this is a quite complicated procedure, but the point is that we can do this, this preparation, this state preparation, very efficiently. Okay, so we start from the ground state. We use two-photon laser excitation to bridge the energy gap between the ground state and some first uh, low angular momentum Rydberg state. Then we apply a microwave transition uh, to, to join basically the, the stark multiplicity of, of the n equals 52 manifold. Then we 
ramp up the, the electric field, which lifts the degeneracy of the manifold. And then we apply a radio frequency field to join this circular Rydberg state. And so actually that's the very delicate part because th this radio fre frequency field that you apply here needs to be very, very purely sigma plus. Otherwise, if you have, let's say, pi transitions, you will immediately go up and get lost in this manifold of states and you will never be able to reach the, the circular state. So you really want to stay on the, on the bottom uh, ladder here. But we, so this needs uh, carefully engineered um, electrode structures with phases uh, and amplitudes on the electrodes that we have to tune very carefully. But nevertheless, we can reach this, this circular state, usually with more than 80% purity, which is quite nice. Okay, so now I have to tell you a little bit how we detect these atoms, because it will become very important for, for the rest. Um, and what happens is that these Rydberg atoms, <clears throat> when they are in, in these different states, so let's say if you do a D state, or F state, or the circular state, they get ionized at different voltages. So the outer electron is loosely bound to the core, so it's very easy to, to rip out this electron and get an ion, which you can then channel to, to a detector. You need fields in the range of 100 volts per centimeter, which is reasonably easy to do in, a, in, in the lab. But since these atoms, they ionize at different voltages, if we apply a ramp of electric field that varies in time, we will ionize the different states at different times. And then if we look at the arri arrival times of, of the ions on the channel tron, we see very sharp peaks that correspond to the different Rydberg levels. And this is quite nice because at every repetition of the experiment, we can detect all the Rydberg states. And so we can detect the population in, in all the Rydberg states. So we just use, we use these two electrodes to ionize them here, and then we channel them to the channel tron by applying electric field because then you have ions, and guiding ions is fairly easy, just applying electric fields, potentials. And this is very, very efficient, by the way, because detecting ions is, is quite an efficient process. Okay, so one first thing that we can do is we prepare atoms in 52C, and then we see how the population spreads out in the adjacent circular states, because I promised you that these um, atoms in 52C, they can only decay to neighboring circular states. So that's this blue curve here. We, we prepare the atoms in a single circular state. And this just is some remaining population in lower angular momentum Rydberg states. And then uh, we just increase the waiting time when we go down this plot before we detect. And what you see very clearly is that there are several peaks that appear. And as you wait more and more, you have more and more peaks that appears. And that's just simply this state that decays to neighboring circular states. So this is quite, quite nice to see. And you can actually fit this data with a, a rate equation model, simple, simple model and you get a lifetime for the 52C state of six milliseconds, which gives uh, an effective black body environment uh, microwave temperature of around 10 Kelvin. So at the beginning, I think I promised several tens of milliseconds. We're not completely there yet because we are not at, at zero Kelvin environment, but still this is a big increase with respect to low angular momentum uh, platforms. Okay, so now instead of just waiting for the atoms to, to decay and to get populated by black body radiation, we can actually do coherent um, operations between these circular Rydberg states. So we can do essentially spectroscopy. And this will turn out to be a very good diagnostic tool to understand what's happening to our Rydberg atoms. Because Again, you have to remember that these circular states, they have no optical transition, so you, can use, you cannot use laser to probe them. You have to rely on microwave. Okay, so here I can just show you that if I prepare my atoms in 52C, 
I can very easily go to 49C, 53C, all these circular states that are nearby with quite high efficiencies, above 80% usually, which is incidentally also required uh, for the quantum simulator. You know, we want to uh, connect the, the 50C circular state with the 48C, if you remember. Okay, and using these coherent operations... Uh, if you say 80%, so does it mean that if you initialize the system, you fully load your, your atoms, mm -hmm. then you, you shine one laser on all of them, and 80% of them can be then released? Or is a single atom... So that's, that's just for the transfer between two circular levels. So you've already prepared in one circular level, and you just transfer to another one. Um, and I mean, so here we are dealing with uh, a cloud of Rydberg atoms. So they see a sort of inhomogeneous environment. So that this limited uh, transfer also takes that into account, basically. If you would have one single atom, I expect that this transfer would be higher. Probably. But this, this transition you have to do then for individual atoms. So you, you have to select this in, 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 the f in the future, you mean for the simulator? So, in principle, yes. Or you can just. Uh, so here it's in the bulk, but in the end you will choose to do it. For yeah, in principle, yes. Yeah. Well, but one other thing that you can do is, for example, prepare all your atoms in spin-up and do an adiabatic evolution across this phase diagram towards some other phase, and then start from here. That's, that's another option, actually. But it would be nice if we, if we could do that. So we are thinking, actually, of ways to do that in the, in the future. And so we can do coherent operations between these circular uh, Rydberg levels, the one thing that we have to do, basically, is check the coherence of these two Rydberg atoms, two Rydberg levels that are separated by, by, two, um, by two, actually, in, in the principal quantum number. That's what we need for the, for the simulator. So one first thing that we can do is that we prepare atoms in, in 52C. We apply a first pi over two microwave pulse so we prepare an, an equal weight superposition of 52C and 50C. Then we let this superposition evolve, and we apply another pi over 2 pulse to freeze out the evolution after some time tau that we can vary, and then we detect. And so what we see is uh, beautiful Ramsey oscillations. And the decay of these oscillations gives us already an inf some information about the coherence of the system. And in, in this case, it's uh, 45 microseconds. So what we can also do is, between these two pi over two pulses, we can uh, insert a pi pulse that basically, when the, the, the spin dephase uh, during this, this uh, evolution, the, these pi pulse allow them to, to rephase. And so we get a revival of oscillation after some time in which, in the Ramsey experiment, the oscillations are completely damped. And now, if we fit the, the contrast of this revival as a function of the time where we apply these pi poles, we get a contrast decay with a, a time scale of 260 microseconds. So that's the, let's say, coherence time of our system now. And the point is that uh, after a careful uh, analysis of all the sources of noise uh, in our system, we, we are fairly convinced that this decoherence comes from magnetic field noise. And that's actually quite good because we have not taken any precaution to, to shield the, the system from magnetic noise whatsoever. So this, it will be very easy to improve on that, actually. So we're quite hopeful. And now I want to really come to the to the most important experimental results that I want to show you, which is the first laser trapping of circular Rydberg atoms. Uh, and first of all, I have to tell you a little bit of, about how you can trap a Rydberg atom. So I mentioned that circular Rydberg atoms, they have no optical transitions, and that means that you cannot use a regular dipole trap to trap them. 
Um, however, what happens is that this valence electron is quite loosely bound to the nucleus, and it's almost free. And what happens if you put an electron, uh, a free electron in a rapidly varying uh, electric field? Well, you get a positive ponderomotive energy shift. And what that means is that this electron is a low field seeker. It will want to go towards regions uh, where the electric field is zero, basically. And if you can create such a trap where you have a low field region, surrounded by high field regions, you will trap this electron, and since it's still bound to the nucleus, you will trap the whole atom as a result. So that's really a quite interesting mechanism for, for trapping. And so how do you create this, this trap? Well, you simply make a donut beam, uh, which you can, I mean, which is parameterized by Lager-Gauss uh, polynomial coefficients, um, and you realize transverse confinement of your atom. And so if you put realistic numbers on, on your, what you can do with your lasers, you can get traps that are almost as deep as ground state tweezer traps, which is quite, quite nice for the, for the future for the simulator. Okay, so now I, I will need to tell you a little bit about the whole setup that we use to generate this trapping beam. So this seems quite complicated, but don't be afraid. So this is just uh, another way of looking at this detection that I told you about before, where we create ions that we channel to, to the channel tron. This is the cryostat. Um, this red uh, blurry thing is the cold cloud of rubidium atoms inside the cryostat. And then we have this red laser here and this blue laser there that creates Rydberg atoms in this small region here. Okay, and now on top of that, we want to overimpose our trapping beam. Uh, so we use a, a laser beam at 1064 nanometers. Actually, this, this wavelength doesn't matter uh, too much for the Rydberg atoms. So we choose a, a wavelength that is convenient where you can get high laser powers. And we send this beam, which is Gaussian here, to a spatial light modulator. So that's really a wonderful device. That's a liquid crystal-based uh, device that allows you to uh, impose on it arbitrary phase patterns. So you, you impose on your laser beam arbitrary phase patterns that are digitally reconfigurable. And when you put a, a focusing lens here, you can get arbitrary light patterns uh, the position of your atoms. So you can create a donut beam like that, but you can also create arrays of donut beams if you want, and we've done that already. Um, so it gives you a lot of freedom. Okay, and if we look uh, at the beams here, we have this blue laser, which is ar around 10 micrometers in diameter, and that's the one that sets the, the size of the region in which we create Rydberg atoms and we have this trapping laser. And so you understand that the, the alignment between these two lasers needs to be very carefully done, because basically if you have your trapping beam here and you create your Rydberg atoms there, you have no chance of trapping them. So you have to create your Rydberg atoms inside this trapping region. So what you need for that is to get in situ diagnostics of your, of your trapping beam. And so the first way you can do that is looking at the light shift on the ground to Rydberg uh, excitation. Yeah? So is this now a two-dimensional? Yes, that's, 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 that's a tube, basically. So it's easy to generalize that to, to three dimensions. You know, it has been done already, not for, uh, yeah, in, in other systems, let's say. Um, but we started with this uh, also because of the peculiarities of our detection. I will detail a bit more uh, in, in, the, in the following. So what you basically want to get is a measurement of the intensity of your trapping laser at the position of your atoms. And this you can do by looking at the light shift on this ground to Rydberg state transition. So 
if you focus on, on this part here, this is just my blue laser in which I create Rydberg atoms without the trapping laser. And this is the black curve that I have here. I look at the number of Rydberg atoms that I create as a function of the detuning of this blue laser here with respect to the Rydberg state. And I just see a sharp peak. Fine, that's good. And then if I look at the blue uh, inset here, what this is is actually when we position the trapping laser such that uh, the intensity is maximal on, on the atoms. And what you see is a strong light shift of this black curve towards positive detunings. Right? And as you go closer to the center of this donut, you see that the light shift becomes smaller and smaller, and that you recover population at zero detuning, so in the dark, but that's the dark inside the, the trapping region. So that's quite nice, and if, if I show you this plot um, for several positions of this trapping laser with respect to this blue laser, basically what you see here is a, is a kind of cut of the donut beam across the atomic cloud, which is, which, which is quite, quite cool, actually. Um, however, there is one problem with this, um, is that if I need to find out the, the center of the beam, if I need to take all these uh, scans of, of this transition, this is very slow. And, well, I have drifts in my experiment. Um, and so that's not very practical. It's, it's kind of beautiful, but it's not practical. So we thought of uh, another way to, to align the two beams, which would be faster and more practical. And we just sort of stumble upon it, actually. And this is linked to photoionization. So this is something that I didn't mention before. But circular states, they do not photoionize in a laser field. And the reason is that the, the electron spends its time completely away from the nucleus. And to get photoionization, you need overlap between the electron and the nucleus. Uh, however, low angular momentum states, they do get ionized. And this is actually quite detrimental to trapping. Now, when we looked at our, this is again um, some arrival time of ions on the detector. And we looked at our signal. The, the blue curve is when the, the laser, the trapping laser is turned off. And what we saw is that when we turn on the trapping laser, we have this sort of uh, peak that appears. And that's photoionization of uh, low angular momentum states. Um, and so what we thought is, well, can we use that as, uh, as a diagnostic of the alignment between, between the two lasers, basically? And yes, this turns out to work actually very nicely. So if you do a transverse cut again, you scan the position of your donut beam with respect to your Rydberg cloud, and you look at the, the photoionization signal. So you just integrate this signal in a, in a certain window. What you see when you displace your trap with respect to your uh, Rydberg cloud is a very beautiful cut of this uh, donut beam. And this is much, much faster than, than the light shift uh, scan because essentially each point here corresponds to one full scan of the light shift integrated, if you want. And what we can actually do, so I don't, I don't have a picture here, but sometimes you look at the at the uh, laser beam on the CCD camera outside of the vacuum chamber. And then the laser beam goes through these three windows and it gets distorted, right? So the picture that you get here is actually not the reality of the shape of the beam inside the chamber. And you can, with this signal, actually correct for the aberrations introduced by the window, which, which is nice. OK, so now we have a very reliable and fast way to align our Rydberg atom cloud in the center of our trapping beam. And the last ingredients that we, that we need is to uh, check if the atoms are trapped or not. So while well, you can ask a very fundamental question, what is trapping? Trapping is basically that you show that you can localize some object in space. Okay, That's a very trivial thing to say. But 
our problem is that our detection is not specially resolved. So let's say if you would have a laser beam and you shine it on a ground state atom, you see that the, the atom emits fluorescence when the laser beam passes on it. And the laser beam has a, a size of a few micrometers, so you have a resolution of, of a few micrometers in space for your detection. But with our Rydberg levels, since we ionize basically everything in the region defined by our ionization electrodes, which are very big, um, our detection is really non-specially resolved. So there we have a problem to detect trapping. And so our answer to this problem is to basically apply an electric field gradient across the atom cloud. Now what happens is that each uh, atom in this cloud acts as a, as a local probe of its electric field environment. And so now, if you prepare your atom cloud and let it expand thermally, um, what you will see is that all these little probes, they get away from each other in this, in this gradient, and so they all resonate at different frequencies, so you should, you should see a blurring of your spectroscopy line. Okay, and so, I mean, that's more of a technical detail, but these circular to circular transitions, they are not sensitive to electric field. Um, at least not to first order, so we have to rely on a more exotic transition between a circular level and a elliptical uh, orbit level. But that's, that's just experimental detail. So what we do is we prepare atoms in our favorite state 52C. We let the cloud expand thermally or not, depending if we have the trap on or not. Then we transfer to this uh, electric field sensitive transition, and we detect. Okay, and what you see now is that after three milliseconds of the trap being on or off, I have a very clear difference. So the red curve is if the trap is off, and the atoms just expand in this gradient, and the light, the, the spectroscopic line becomes very broad. But if I turn the trap on, the atoms stay localized in space, so they all resonate at the same frequency, and the line is quite sharp again. Okay, and now if I show you a plot of the, of the width of this line as a function of detection delay, in red for the untrapped atoms, and in blue for the trapped atoms, I think I can convince you that we have indeed trapped these, these Rydberg atoms. And incidentally, this red curve that I show here is just a ab initio model uh, with no free parameter, which reproduces quite well the data, so we understand really well what's happening there. Okay, so I just have two more experimental slides. Um, now, one very important parameter for a trap is a measurement uh, of, of, its, of the trapping frequency, so how steep the trap uh, really is. And if you can show that your atoms have a certain uh, trapping frequency. This is really a smoking gun for, for trapping. So there are several ways to do that experimentally. And the way that we chose is to parametrically uh, excite the atoms out of the trap. So what you do is you modulate the depths of your trap and you parametrically uh, drive the motion of the atoms inside the trap. And when you, when you hit the right frequency, which is the resonant uh, frequency for the atoms in the trap, they get expelled out of the trap. And now if I show you basically the population of atoms in the trap as a function of the modulation fre frequency, you see a very clear peak here, which again is sort of a smoking gun that, that we have trapped these atoms. Uh, the problem with this is that we have to drive this, this uh, parametric excitation really hard so the amplitude of modulation is really big in our case. Uh, and so you have, you have anharmonicities and it's quite hard to, to model this, this thing and to really extract the proper uh, oscillation frequencies of, of your atoms in, in this case. But from, let's say, measurements, uh, other measurements, we estimate a dropping frequency of around two kilohertz. I should say that this is still a bit preliminary. Okay, and one final thing that I want to mention is that uh, we have checked that the 
coherence of our uh, Rydberg atom superposition is not affected by the trapping light. And this is, of course, a very important requirement for the quantum simulator, because if your trapping light completely scrambles the coherence of your, of your superposition, uh, this, this will not work out. Okay, so the way we do that is we do a very narrow scan of a circular to circular transition, uh, and the width of, of this uh, curve is a measure of the, of the coherence of the system. And we do this measurement uh, in light blue here without trapping, and in dark blue here with trapping. And we show that there is no uh, significant line width difference between the two. So this tells us that the coherence is not affected by the trapping, which is great. Okay, so I just want to conclude now. Um, I just want to tell you a little bit about our plans for the, for the future. So we have these circular Rydberg atoms that are cold in a very cold cryogenic environment. We can trap them, but now we, we want to go towards really quantum simulation. So we need individual atom control, okay? And so for that, we need to open up the vacuum, put uh, high numerical aperture lenses to get single atom control. And in the first steps, we will look at interactions between a few uh, Rydberg atoms and uh, basically probe this, this Hamiltonian, this XXZ Hamiltonian that I showed you at the beginning. Uh, and also we need to extend basically our 2D trapping to 3D trapping. Uh, but this is reasonably easy to do, so that's an example of a, a 3D trap geometry that, we, that we've done. This is just uh, an image on a, on a CCD camera, but it shows you that you have a small pocket of dark um, where you can when you can trap your, your atoms. Okay, and this is also a team effort, so it's, it's a bit too much to try to integrate all this all at once. So first of all, we want to to create these spin chains uh, with tweezers. But in parallel, we have another team that works on this spontaneous inhibition of, of this, uh, this, this inhibition of spontaneous emission for cold uh, circular atoms at room temperature. And then we will put uh, everything together and, and build this thing finally. Okay, so these are the the persons that are driving the experiments. So Michel is now the, the group leader, uh, and Clément is the, the main PI on this uh, quantum simulator uh, experiment. And Sébastien is actually responsible for the experiment that demonstrates uh, inhibition of spontaneous emission. Okay, so now I also want to discuss a bit the perspectives uh, in the long run, what we can do with this uh, circular Rydberg atom simulator. So obviously the, the great selling point of this is to look at long-term dynamics. So return, of, uh, return to equilibrium after, after a quench, uh, quantum thermodynamics, um, thermalization over very long time scales. Um, in, in our system, we can also look at effects of disorder. Um, if, if we look at the, at the tweezer platform, that's quite easy to introduce this order. Um, we can also think about ex extending this uh, using coupling to, to, a, commonic, to a, a common bosonic bath, um, or do Floquet engineering. And another thing that we can do in principle when we will have this 1D spin chain is to put two spin chains close to, to each other, uh, and that's uh, in, turns out to be interesting for spin one physics. So the, the principles of the quantum simulator uh, are, are in, this, in this paper, uh, and the experimental results are, are not published yet. Okay, so with this, I just want to thank the team and the people who do the work uh, in the lab with me, uh, and I want to thank you guys for your attention. That, 
So, so uh, you know, what you have now, right? So Node.js, right? Just uh, user atoms, uh, so just atoms, and then you start exciting some input states. So are they impurities? Are they dense? Do they interact with each other? So, I mean, in, in the current geometry, where we have just a magneto-optical trap, the, the gas is very dilute, so the, these effects are essentially negligible. But so I mentioned that at some point during the presentation that we are doing these experiments uh, close to, to an atom chip, and that's because the, the original goal of this experiment was to have a BEC and um, create Rydberg uh, states in this BEC, so you have a very uh, strongly interacting system. And so they did in, in the past some, some measurements about that. Um, let's say that's not the, the research direction that we are we're going towards because we really want to move now towards this, uh, this single atom control. Um, but for example, um, Tilman Thau is uh, doing such kind of physics where basically what he does is, uh, do I have, Okay. He basically creates uh, a Rydberg state and he puts, uh, he puts ground state atoms inside the, the orbit of this Rydberg state and he, he looks at, at interesting physics there. And it's true that actually circular Rydberg atoms could be very interesting for this kind of physics. Um, I think he is going to do that. <laughs> That's not our uh, our business for for now. Let's see. Okay. Yes. So I guess that's because I didn't detail too much how we will prepare this this chain of spins. I mean, so I think it's still sort of an open question, but we have some ideas about that. Um, so, yeah, please. Yes. Well, I think one argument is that this long-range interaction for ion chains is non-state selective. So here you have a, an interaction which is internal state dependent. So that's ad, that adds more degrees of freedom and complexity to the, to the problem and more possibilities, I should say. Um, yeah, that would be my, my short answer. And then... Um, the, the, yeah, go ahead. So, the, okay, that's, that's one thing. Uh, with this capacitor uh, picture, you, you cannot use tweezers. That's, that's one of the problems. Because if you want tweezers, you need to focus your laser beam really tightly. Uh, and what will most likely happen with the, the kind of size of capacitor that you need to uh, inhib inhibit spontaneous emission very efficiently will have clipping of the tweezer on the capacitor itself. Okay, so this very nice, let's say, customizable 2D geometry that, for example, Antoine Broways does with his tweezer traps, uh, this is not compatible uh, with, the, with the capacitor thing. So, I mean, I think there are certainly several possibilities. You can look at, at 2D systems, but you won't be able to probe the dynamics over many, 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 many interaction cycles. But what you can also think of doing is doing such a, a 1D spin chain and putting another one next to it. So that's another way of doing a 2D system, which, is, which has a less uh, flexible geometry, but which, which can still be interesting. Yeah, so you can think about doing some, some things like that. Um, then it becomes sort of an, engi in, an engineering problem. Um, 
but I think the thing is if you drill holes, uh, you don't efficiently suppress spontaneous emission anymore. So, I mean, yeah, I, I, have, I would have to put numbers on that, basically, with taking into account the, the strong divergence of the, of the tweezer trap and seeing how big the holes would be there and if it would completely destroy the, this spontaneous emission inhibition or not. But there might be a way to engineer this, this structure such that it's compatible with tweezers. <laughs>